Okay, I have 6.30 and uh, Tammy, I believe all council members are present and staff are present. So I'd like to call the Amberley Village Council meeting of July or June 14, 2021 to order. Please call the roll. Richard Bardak. Here. Peg Conway. Here. Ben Hunt. Here. Alita Kamine. Here. Tom Muthing. Here. Ray Warren. Here. Natalie Wolf. Here. Scott Larmer. Present. Andy Cakey. Here. Chief Wallace. Here. Rick K. Here. And if everyone could please join me in uh, Pledge of Allegiance, again, you can stay seated. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda this evening is our minutes from our last meeting of May 10, 2021. Those minutes were circulated in advance. Are there any questions, comments, or changes to those minutes? Seeing none, we can consider the minutes approved. Next item on the agenda is our finance report from April 2021. Turn it over to the village manager. Thank you, Mayor. The finance committee met and reviewed the finances for the month of April, and that's what I'll be reporting on this evening. The uh, month of April in regards to earnings tax generated about $454,000. We have an estimate of taking in $3 million this year. So uh, right now we're at $1.1 million. So we've taken in about 33%. Uh, and as you are aware, the tax due date was shifted from April 15th to May 17th. So this does not reflect the extended deadline. Uh, other revenues that we've received, we did receive property tax, uh, the amount of $85,000. This was the balance of property tax uh, revenue for the first half of 2021. Uh, and then we did receive about another $87,000 uh, property tax allocation. Uh, the village did book uh, local government revenue funds in the amount of $4,400 for the month of, of April. Our total revenue for the month of April was $712,000. Uh, for revenue overall for the uh, for the general fund, we've taken in about 43% of our estimate. Our estimate is $5.1 million. So we're at 2.2 at this uh, at this point, this juncture in, in April. On the expense side, the month of April was a $329,000 expense. And year to date, we have spent $1.9 million of our general fund budget. The general fund budget for 2021 is $5.7 million. So we're sitting at about 33% of our funds have been expended thus far. Uh, this leaves us at the end of April with a, a general fund unencumbered balance of nearly $5.6 million. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions for the manager? Okay, uh, seeing none. We'll move, now move on to our citizens to address council. Uh, and again, um, when I call on you, just state your name and address, and then you have three minutes to address council. I'd first like to call on Nancy, Nancy Steinberg Warren. I'm Nancy Steinberg Warren and I live at 6715 West Farm Acres Drive. I want to address the ordinance establishing leash regulations for Amberley Green. Council has listened to opinions of the many parties who care about and use the green for a variety of recreational purposes. The fact that some Amberley Village residents no longer use the green because of quotes, negative, even injurious dog encounters end of quote, suggests to me that measures attending to the safety of people should be incorporated into the ordinance. There are two points that I believe are inadequate about the ordinance. First, the ordinance states what it means for an unleashed dog to be, quotes, under control, end of quote, has been difficult to define and enforce in the past. I'm not sure this will be possible in the future. 
By allowing unleashed dogs on the green, Amberley Village is undertaking a liability. All users of the green should know they are taking on a personal risk when dogs are allowed to be unleashed. Second, I understand several Amberley Village residents whose property adjoins the green have reported unleashed dogs roaming on their grounds and even disrupting personal events. I do not see anything in the ordinance to address this concern. I believe electric or physical fencing along private property borders should be incorporated into the ordinance and Amberley Village taxpayers should be informed of the cost to us of such fencing and other costs for allowing dogs to go unleashed. My personal opinion is that I'm not comfortable with dogs being unleashed at any time, but I understand others feel differently and I can see room for middle ground. However, I believe the proposed timing is too generous, a total of about five to six hours a day. I would suggest keeping the dawn to 9 a.m. only time frame and eliminating the 3 to 5 p.m. time for unleashed dogs. Keep it simple. Council should be clear-eyed regarding which voices, among many, should guide your discourse around this ordinance. The voices of Amberley Village residents who fund the significant financial burden of upkeep of the green property, and of course the opinions of Amberley Village residents whose property adjoin the green should carry significant weight in your deliberations. I believe non-residents' opinions and feelings of, quote, ownership of the green and its policies should be kept tangential to your decision making. Lastly, the robust discussion around leashing and unleashing dogs leads me to encourage all members of Amberley Village Council to reframe the conversations. How about exploring and suggesting creative uses of the green? In its current state, no changes or costs involved for the enjoyment of all village residents. Promoting events such as picnics, walkathons, nature walks, bird watches, meetings, classes, etc., will encourage more Amberley Village residents, adults, and children to take advantage of what we are paying for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Any questions? If not, we'll move on to uh, Alan Garber, please. Um, Alan Garber, 6735 West Beachlands Drive. Let me see, I was also gonna be on camera, but I guess not, can't figure it out. It's all right. <laughs> anyway, um, I grew up, wait, I just found it. No, nope, there you I, go, oh, I got you. You got me, I don't see anyone now. But, no, I see you. Okay, I, I have notes so that I stay on track since I tend to get off track. I grew up in Amberley Village the first thing that my parents moved into their home was my crib. So that tells you how long I've been in the village because we know how old I am. My husband and I moved back to raise our family 30 years ago. And this is the first time that I have felt so strongly about an issue that I spoke last week at the committee meeting and to council tonight. Amberley Green is not a dog park but a beautiful green space for Amberley residents to enjoy park-like natural setting. Amberley Village purchased the 133-acre Crest Hills Country Club in 2008 for a sizable, a sizable amount of money, and it is the Amberley residents' taxes that pay for the upkeep of the grounds. Amberley, Amberley Green is one of the gems in Amberley Village and should be kept as a safe area for its residents to be able to walk, run, and just enjoy the grounds without worrying about getting jumped on by loose, uncontrollable dogs. Seven weeks ago, I was walking around the backside of the trail and I was knocked off balance by a dog that was off leash. I said to the owner that his dog was not under control. The owner said, yes, the dog was controlled and I said that he jumped up on me and almost knocked me down. We got into a heated discussion of his dog and he told me to move along. I told him clearly he was not an Amberley resident 
as his dog was not under control and not aware of the rules. This was not a friendly conversation. While I was walking on the pass, I saw about 20 dogs and only two little dogs were being led on a leash while the rest were off leash. When I left the parking lot, I noticed that of the 19 cars, two, which mine was one of two, had Amberly stickers, two had Amberly green permits, and the other 15 had no Amberly identification. Until this incident, I did not realize how many non-Amberly residents were taking advantage of our Amberly green at the expense of Amberly taxpayers. This is not a public Hamilton County Park, but part of Amberley Village. I own two dogs and I truly am a dog lover, but dogs should not be allowed to run free if they have the tendency to jump on people. I have some concerns that I would like to voice now. My first one is after to me, Green, no on next door, where people from all parts of Cincinnati were commenting on the dog park in Amberley with comments on taking their dogs and their dogs being able to run freely. Before this and the incident at the green, I had no idea how many people were utilizing and so many non-Amberley residents that did not pay the taxes for upkeep of the green. Again, this is not a dog park, and I believe this perception must be changed. My second concern, when did the village start prioritizing dogs being able to run over the safety and enjoyment of our residents at Amberley Green? Who is getting better treatment, the dogs or the residents? Besides getting knocked off balance, I would love to bring my young granddaughter to walk the trails and enjoy the nature of Amberley Green. As it stands now, I am afraid to bring her there with dogs off leash. If I was knocked off balance, what would happen to her? My third concern, at what point did the village decide to, re to turn Amberley Green into a public park? For years, it was only residents or people who had registered the vehicles for an Amberley Green sticker. All Hamilton County parks require a, a sticker at entrance. This is not about exclusivity, but safety. Why are the original rules of the green not being enforced anymore? Fourth, how will the village enforce the compliance with the ordinance? An ordinance is only good if it is enforced. And my last one, as I am walking and observe violations, what process will there be in place to report the offenders? Thank you very much for listening to my situation and my concerns. And I also do not believe that we should be having dogs off leash. And if they, if we, to, to take care of ev everybody's needs, maybe just the dust to nine. So thank you very much for listening to my concerns. Thank you, Ms. Garber. Are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll now move on to Jim Ruley. You're muted, Jim. You're muted. Hi, thank you. I'm sorry for that. I'm Jim Ruley from 6815 West Beachlands Drive. I'm here to update the council on the activities of the Amberley We Thrive Health and Wellness Committee. Um, overall, the goal of We Thrive is to show Amberley's commitment to health and wellness by encouraging community engagement to improve health, safety, and vitality. Currently, the member status is one, that's me. My wife is sometimes helpful, but I wanna also say, say thank you to Christy Iwasco from the Hamilton County Public Health Department who has been invaluable to me to keep things moving. Uh, a brief explanation about why I am the only member currently serving on the Health and Wellness Committee. Uh, we have been hurt by COVID-19. Uh, one member has died uh, and we had a great working relationship with the JCC prior to COVID. COVID uh, really, as you probably all know, 
lost a lot of staffing, had to shift priorities, and therefore has not been able to meet with us as often. Um, another member of our group left for personal reasons. The good news is recently I've had four people express interest in joining the HWC, and those uh, I'm in, currently in discussions with those people. Now, briefly, the current projects that we have underway, we have yoga on the lawn, uh, it's, and that is in with co cooperation with the JCC. Yoga on the lawn is held weekly, every Thursday evening from 7 to 8 p.m. on the uh, south lawn, south of the tennis courts, and that will be running through August. It is free and open to the public. We are also exploring Zumba on the green. We were approached by some residents who um, have been doing this at the green and they would like to have that sponsored by the village and supported in whatever way is possible. So again, we are exploring that. We've recently released a survey with a, uh, which is asking questions about the activities uh, uh, that the residents may or may not be aware of and have participated in of both our committee, like Yoga on the Lawn, but also many of the activities from the Environmental Stewardship Committee, which is our sister We Thrive Committee. Uh, we are, uh, as uh, uh, the survey was lo uh, launched on social media, um, on, on our Amberley Village social media uh, on May 27th, and as of June, we've received 150 responses. Uh, we're reviewing and analyzing that data, and we're targeting mid-July for a report to council. The last item I have is the support of council and administration. I'd like to thank uh, the village manager and the clerk of council for the support that they have given. This includes the survey support, very helpful in launching the survey um, and also posting, um, I, uh, posting on yoga on the lawn on social media and posting the sign along Ridge Road. When we ask people who come to yoga how they found out about it, several of them have said, we've seen the sign. And they're referring to the sign that's up on uh, Ridge Road. So thank you for that. And also uh, when a resident was asking about Zumba to uh, the village manager, he referred them to us, which is uh, great to see that that uh, shows support. And finally, finally for council representation, uh, we are meeting with Ben Hunt this week and look forward to his guidance. Uh, council, a council rep will be helpful to clarify uh, the interest and capabilities of the village and also the responsibilities that we need to follow in order to um, conduct our activities. One example would be waivers, especially if there's any liability concerns to the village. Thank you. Jim. Thank you for your presentation. And, and as the uh, council rep on the Environmental Stewardship Committee, you know, I know this COVID period has been very difficult for groups that are heavily dependent upon peer volunteers. Uh, and I thank you for your passion to continue to drive this. And I, you know, I think the next few months are going to be very important, especially is as we lead up to the ice cream social and using the ice cream social to really try to get more passion around this because you know th your group is doing a lot of good work and you know i think the potential's there and we just got to realize it so thank you very much thank you John? Um, i i think uh the vice mayor has a comment also I do, Jim. Thank you so much for coming to report to council on We Thrive. I think, um, you know, when we passed the ordinance in support of we Th the Health and Wel Wellness Committee, um, it, I mean, it really gave you your committee the uh, the power to come to council, and by doing that, and we're and speaking to the village about what the Health and Wellness Committee does. And I do think that you're on the right track. Um, in my opinion, your committee is a just a place where any ideas that residents have can come and percolate and become um, an activity. And not necessarily, like health and wellness, and we thrive, um, 
it is it is a very very broad definition um hamilton county public health has six pathways of what they consider health not just bodily health but social health um, um environmental health uh, for example the environment we've we've we discovered through as you know our pathways jim that that we already had a environmental health pathway committee because we already had the environmental health uh the environmental stewardship committee and in my opinion the um, human rights commission also is it fits right into the mission of we thrive in that social justice and social issues are, are part of the social pathway um so it's you're just just the ideas are there and um your committee is a great springboard to making them happen i've been to yoga and it is great and um you know i'm hesitant to go while cicadas are flying around as many other people maybe are as well but i think zumba is a terrific idea and when nancy warren spoke um earlier she made me immediately think of the health and wellness committee when she listed um a, a, a whole bunch of activities that it would be fun for the village to engage in on amberly green so really thank you and i i'm excited to see people join and and bring their ideas to your committee thank you thanks ben for joining we thrive any other, any other comments from council members? Okay, again, thanks, Mr. Rowley. We'll now move on to Colin Driscoll. Uh, Colin Driscoll, 6600 Ridge Road. Um, I, I've talked a variety of times on this, so I'm not going to say things I've said before really but at the parks committee i think i referred to myself as a power user somebody took that the wrong way i think potentially i think i should have really clarified that more as more of like an ambassador you know people that spend a lot of time there uh interact with a lot of people and have a pretty good sense of some of the things that go on there just by the amount of time they spend there but the two things i wanted to bring up you know, I feel uh, to a large extent the, the village has brought this issue upon itself through the lack of reasonable permit enforcement at Amberley Green. The property was initially open to Amberley residents requiring a resident sticker. Non-residents started parking the cars on nearby streets and walked into the park. Non-resident stickers came into being in part through residents on nearby streets complaining about parked cars and people crossing uh, Ridge Road, which was deemed a public safety issue. So non-resident permits were created and were, are available at Village Hall. Current signage at Amberley Green states the following. Uh, I took a picture of the sign. Uh, parking by permit only. Others will be ticketed or towed. Um, so has this ordinance ever been realistically enforced the ticketing the towing of not you know people without the proper permit how many people have been cited how many people have been towed we seem to have data on you know the dog complaints but what about this data on this type of enforcement the sign says will be it does not say maybe or after x number of fractions you might be but it says will be. If, if the village towed those who failed to register, this action would have been extremely effective in keeping the overwhelming number of permitless non-residents in check. In my mind, the vast majority of incidents at Amberley Green have come from those who don't hold a valid village permit. Imagine the visual impact on a busy day, call it Saturday morning, of seeing a half dozen vehicles towed off the property at the owner's expense while their non-permit owners are out enjoying the park. I'm not sure what it would look like when they got back to the lot. Had the village sporadically towed violators, word would have immediately spread and the large contingent without permits 
would have been held in check. Uh, my second comments on the ordinance itself, it's pretty quick. Uh, the penalty area uh, fails to comply with sections A to F on the first offense, and then it goes on to each subsequent offense, and it even ends in may be imprisoned for not more than 30 days. Do we have the jail facilities to imprison people for up to 30 days? If not at the municipal building, are we talking about ankle bracelets and house arrests? What other village ordinances have the potential for 30-day imprisonment? Section D within this area uh, referenced above says refrains from chasing wildlife. So if my pup Hawkeye gets caught chasing a squirrel, I get cited more than once for this. Are you telling me I might be put in jail for 30 days, most likely costing my job? You may, you know, we may say that Tom would never do this, but what if our next mayor isn't as good natured as Tom? Thank you. It'd be Tom. Okay, hey, are there any questions for Mr. Driscoll? And thank you, Mr. Driscoll, for your comments. If not, we'll now move on to Dave Mabo. Yeah, uh, David Mabo, 7590 Elbrook. Um, my parents moved to the village in 1974 while I was away in college. And I moved here full time in 1986 when I married my wife. Um, I was really surprised by two things over the course of time. I didn't realize that we were issuing permits to non village residents. Uh, somehow I missed that. Um, but I, I'm really concerned. I have. My parents moved here with three dogs. Uh, we've had three dogs at one point, all three at one time. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just can't see using a dog park, the, the whole green as a dog park. Um, my stepson had a Jack Russell. They used to go to a dog park. That was a fenced in what acres so the dog loved it uh, but i just the 133 acre open space does not make sense for a dog park so the question becomes is the village willing to spend thousands of dollars to erect a fence and manage a small dog park and you know uh, from what are mostly non-village residents I know that um, Rich has dogs, Natalie has dogs. I don't know who else on the council has dogs, uh, but you know, uh, it's a lot of money and uh, it's a big problem. The other thing is, is that, um, you know, there are dog bite issues, uh, kids going up to pets, dogs they don't know, uh, nip, um, very enthusiastic dogs knock people over. Uh, my next door neighbor has a wonderful puppy. Uh, it's very friendly, but if it wasn't on the leash, it'd be knocking every kid on the block over when they go over to greet it. And I think those are real issues when you have an off-leash park. So I think this is a bad idea. Now, I don't agree with Colin uh, on towing cars. Uh, I think, you know, a $25 fine would be great if people don't have a permit, but you don't want to be towing 20 cars on a Saturday. I do agree with Nancy and Ellen uh, on their thoughts, but I think this is a problem for the village. And I think making a leash-free park out of it, the only large dog park is not what we want to have happen as a resident. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mabo. Uh, are there any comments from council members, questions? Thank, thank you to all the residents who spoke this evening. And we'll now move on to committee reports. First committee is the Public Buildings and Parks Committee. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we are presenting tonight for a second reading 
uh, Ordinance 2021-8, Adopting Leash Regulations for Amberly Green. Uh, the committee met on June 8th uh, for the purpose of hearing input from the public. And we had 10 speak, well, actually we had, we had about 30 people show up and 10 people spoke. They were all Amberly residents. Uh, seven of them requested a leash law full-time, fully, and three uh, others spoke of how much they value open space for dogs and how much they enjoy it and offered some varied suggestions on how it could be made better um, to manage that. Um, so that's the current state of things. I'd like to make a couple of general comments um, based on what we've heard thus far kind of over the whole time, not just in the, since the last meeting. Um, kind of some conclusions I have drawn from the input that we have received. And the first thing is whatever we do, if we, the ordinance that we adopt eventually uh, needs to be very, have a lot of clarity to it. We have arrived at the situation we are in due to a lack of clarity in our ordinance around dogs under control. And some of the suggestions that have ma been made uh, as to how to manage the property while still allowing um, sizable, significant off-leash opportunity from an outer loop, you know, designating an outer loop for leashes and an inner loop for off-leashes or parcels in the back or parcels in certain places. And even the question of hours off-leash, the, the designating areas is, to me, I do not understand how that could possibly work. Um, on an, any kind of honor system. And even the designating of hours, the evening time hours seems to be kind of really where we're, nego where we're still discerning and still getting, getting interest and concern. Um, currently the ordinance says three to five. We've been told that's really not very useful. We've heard that's too much. Um, I myself have concerns about changing it to later because and if it's going to be the same every day because of, you know, then the evening hours are prime time for people who work and everyone should have opportunity during that prime time, not just people who'd like to have their dogs off leash. Um, well, there's been some suggestion around designating the hours based on when dusk is. And I, I again, that's another one. I don't understand how that could work in terms of clarity. Um, one suggestion that we have heard in multiple settings that I have a strong issue with is that people who do not enjoy having dogs around them should go to the walking track or to French Park. And I, I'm actually, I really am strongly uh, almost offended by that sentiment in that all it's been expressed by the residents who spoke this evening that it, the property is paid for and supported by the Amberley residents and all Amberley, we, the, the existence of other options is really not germane to this discussion. The issue is access and safety for everyone. Um, enforcement has been discussed quite a bit, and I think it's important to understand kind of the two aspects of enforcement. The first being right now, again, the lack of clarity, and the ordinance as it is currently written provides more clarity. So there, the issues of the size of the property and the nature of the situation and the size of our police force are going to be with us and it's not it's not going to be perfect it's not going to be the sort of thing where it's every single thing can be followed up in the moment however more follow up will be possible because there will be more specifics around what is expected um so fundamentally i believe that what we need to do is to recalibrate the public perception there there is the perception that this is a dog park and that that is not true it is a property that we acquired, that we have made uh, available. We have not designated it a public park, but in 2012, we opened it to non-residents, not simply because people were parking across the street, but because as part of our We Thrive grant, which funded the community garden, we needed to have a shared use opportunity, and that was what was chosen. And we, there was, you know, other there were people coming from elsewhere, and that seemed like a, a good thing to do. And I mean, I, I do you think it is a good thing to do? I'm not in favor of closing it opportunity to only Amberley residents. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming at it. And I think it would be useful to have some discussion if people have thoughts, but that's up to the mayor. That concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Conway. Uh, other council members, comments? Um, I don't know. Vice mayor, vice mayor, <laughs> vice mayor. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, Peg, I, I want to just 
you and your committee are really doing such a bang up job on this. And Peg, I, I when I listen to you speak about the uh, and and just update us on what the committee has been doing. I mean, you make so much sense, and and I agree with almost everything you said. Um, although I don't agree with the dust part, but I mean that's like the thing is, someone said I don't know how many council members actually have dogs. Well, the majority of us do. <laughs> Um, so we, we, and we do, you know, the majority of us do use Amberly Green with our dogs. So whether or not we are there every single day or not, and the same with our res with residents in Amberley, whether or not they go every single day or not, it, the frequency of use does not matter to me, but I have been thinking about the issue. I had some, something, um, prepared to say last month. I held on to it until now because we had quite a a lot of people and a lot of, um, I would say, chaos at the last meeting. So um, I'm going to read most of it um, because it is I, my idea. Like I just read it through again, and I, I still think that there is some merit here. First of all, um, as had has been said. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to open. I want to say this. Um, I also am offended when I see on next door or here in council or in the committee, the suggestion that people who don't wanna see or be encountered by a dog off a leash should go somewhere else. I find that very, very offensive. Um, and, you know, in my, in my opinion, we are actually under no obligation to make any sort of compromise at all. Um, Amberly already has laws requiring dogs under control. So the de default position in my opinion, and in the majority of com communities, is that under control means dogs on a leash. But I'm not done, so don't stop listening yet. <laughs> um, Amberly Green is not a dog park, and it's not even a park for that matter, which is the crux of the problem and which has been identified over and over again. There are no park amenities, no picnic areas, no play fields, no dedicated park board to enforce any rules. But it is without a doubt one of the most beautiful pieces of property in Amberley, and it should be open to be enjoyed by everyone, um, and um, including people with dogs. So that all being said by introduction, I would like to offer what I consider to be a reasonable compromise. And as I said before, um, to me, it is a compromise be between requiring dogs on a leash full time and allowing dogs to have some off-leash time. It is not a compromise between, equally between dogs off-leash and people who don't want to encounter the dogs. Um, I think what I was su am suggesting is reasonable. I, uh, like I said, I have a dog. I like to take his leash off in Amberly Green. So I suggest that the hours for the off-leash dogs be as already um, in the ordinance, dawn to 9 a.m., but that the afternoon hours be extended until dusk. And when I say dusk, I think that I use that term because it um, it is the same term used by us already in when is Amberly Green open? It's open dawn to dusk. So dusk, you could say, is synonymous with close or dark or whatever. It's with it's until the end. Um, however, the hours that I suggest will only work if dog owners comply with some other common sense rules. Um, I think I read in a an email that was sent today in our council packet that it's really not the dogs who are the bad behaviors, it's the people who own the dogs. Um, so I suggest that the ordinance has what I would call leash zones at all times. And those zones, um, which could be open for discussion, but the clear obvious ones are first, the leashes should be required in the parking lot and at the entire area surrounding the perimeter of the clubhouse, meaning the front and back of the clubhouse where there is um, pavement. Um, leashes should be required from, um, I don't know how you describe it, but there's the pond where dogs like to jump in and swim that's below the community garden. Okay, I don't wanna ruin the fun for the dogs even though there's no swimming in that pond, but 
when you go up the hill towards the clubhouse adjacent to the community garden that seems to be an area where gardeners uh, have encountered dogs off leash so there should always be leashes there and then i also think that um in order to be a good dog owner, you need to be willing to put your leash on when you're approached by other walkers or run runners. Amberly Green is a big place. And from my experience, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, if, if your dog is truly under control, the owner should be able to reach down and hook on that leash when someone is approaching. It should not be considered onerous, only um, it should be considered responsible. Thank you for letting me share. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. Other comments? Richard, Richard, you? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out to unmute. I don't know if I did. I think you I'm did. Okay. You did. I just have a few comments. I know I've spoken previously on this. I do agree with Natalie on some of her comments. I think it should be dawn to 9 a.m. or whatever time that everybody thinks is reasonable. And I think a period of time before dusk is also reasonable. So people that work, say at five o'clock, they don't get off work till five or six, has at least a little bit of time to spend some time at the park. I'm gonna reiterate what I've said before, aggressive dogs should be barred from the park, period. It's very easy to figure out who they are. We all have phones, take a picture, follow them to their cars and take a picture. So we get rid of any aggressive dogs. Aggressive meaning any dogs that certainly bite anybody should be barred from the park and exercise aggressive behavior towards people, meaning biting in any way hurting anybody. I think it's natural that a dog might on occasion jump on somebody even when they're on a leash. That's gonna happen. It's, it's inevitable. I think it's important to have people on the green property regularly I used to walk at French Park uh, for many years before uh, the green opened up. I routinely saw the selling of drugs on that property. I saw it being sold in the parking lot. I saw it being sold throughout the trails. And I think by having people on the premises regularly will defer that property. It certainly will pre won't prevent it, but I think if you have activity, it will make that behavior less likely. Amberley Green, I believe, is 133 acres. French Park, I believe, is 275 acres. The walking track, I don't know, I'm going to guess, is five acres. So I'm going to total that as being approximately 400 acres, give or take. I believe that the village should approach uh, the city, French Park, specifically, to see if they will spend some money on a formal dog park. I think that itself will alleviate, alleviate a lot of this problem. They have the money to do it. They have more than enough ground to do it. And they get the benefit of having weddings there almost every weekend. They're making a lot of money off property that the village donated to them. I think the burden should be on them to spend money on a dog park. And I think they should be approached to do so. I think it's reasonable. And I think that as a, um, as a payback, re recompense to the village for giving them all that property many years ago, that they should do that. I don't see them making much investment in that park over the years. They maintain the, the house at the top. They maintain the, the, the rest area at the top. They maintain the house, which, of course, they use for weddings to make a lot of money on. But short of that, I don't see them making much investment in that property. So I would request whatever village council committee would be in charge of that to approach them. I'm happy to do that. But I think they should be approached. I think that's a reasonable request. And I certainly believe a a dog park on French Park property would certainly alleviate a lot of this issue. And that's really all I have to say other than reiterating what I said before. I, I think that we're making progress, but I think that we need to be reasonable towards all residents, dog owners and not. Thank you. Okay, are there other councilmen or councilwomen that want to uh, speak? If others don't want to speak, I would like a second turn. I'd like to speak. Yeah, I, and I want to say something too, Peg, but anyone else? Yeah. Tom, it's Alita. Okay. Go ahead. Tom, do you see our hands? 
Yeah, right. I think Ray and Ben also had hands, so we can. I, think I don't we, see hands up. I'm no, sorry. No, no, my hand, my my personal hand. Okay, sorry. I think we all. So, so <laughs> we will do Alita, and then Councilman Warren, and then who else? Um, Councilman and Hunt. Councilman Hunt. And then Peck, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I actually, I mean, I, I, it's very rare that I agree with pretty much every single person who's spoken today on everything. Um, I also have some concerns about the dusk thing, so I'll, I'll lean in the peg camp on that a little bit. But, um, but you know, I, I, I echo um, certainly the, the comments about the hard work that, that the Parks Committee has been doing, and I know this is sort of not a science, and there are a lot of things to take into account in terms of the hours piece um, and I don't have the answer I have uh, I'll share you know what has been rattling around in my brain but I, I really you know I think compromise is the key here and the comments from both residents and non-residents that sort of express that understanding of trying to have some level of compromise are the most productive at this stage and I, I really appreciate that certainly taking into account that there are a lot of different you know kind of users and um, and and challenges here. So you know, on on the one hand, you have people like Ellen, who, and I've heard from many other people like this, who express, um, you know, even a even a nice under control dog that comes up, and I've had this experience myself, who is totally under control could um, just approaches without the approval of the person who is being approached, and someone who is, you know, caught off guard, not strong, a small child, a Frail, elderly, like there are a lot of scenarios where um, the owners think that's an okay situation, and users are not are, are shying away. Lots of resident, you don't see a lot of small children on the property. There's a reason why. Um, so I think you know that's one piece, and then of course our residents on on Burning Tree, and I, I will just say kind of in the vein of Rich, I, I do agree with with what Councilman Bardak said that you know I think there's always been a conversation here. There, there are three ancillary pieces i'm going to come back to the core thing but the three ancillary pieces all of which have been brought up today i'd like to just quickly say i think we need to table them for this discussion but come back and talk about all of them one is the idea of a dog park and in a lot of the comments that you know that folks made they said we'd be willing to pay to use re, you know this the conversations about what it might look like to have a dog designated area that is fenced that is maybe for money or going to cincinnati parks or whatever that is a Thing that needs to stay on the table as a separate but discussion that needs to be ongoing i think there's a lot of desire and opportunity there two is the thing nancy brought up about the buffer zone i think you know whatever happens with this property long term that issue is also not going away it's not just about dogs going into people's yards to do business and interrupt dinner there is a you know a buffer zone conversation and i don't think it has to be a fence i think there's other conversations that could happen, grasses or signage or whatever. There's that conversation can be tabled, but should also come back. And the third is what Colin brought up, which is enforcement. I, I also think towing is probably, you know, a, aggressive, but you know, what does that look like to to continue to make sure that this is safety? To me, this whole thing comes down to a public safety issue. This is, you know, residents who came to us three years ago or more who said there are incidents happening. I think the parks committee and the council has been taking and the police department have been taking a very measured approach at trying to deal with that we did a lot of um communications about this we've been trying to work with everybody to try to make this workable and we this is where we are now this is why we're here now um i started this as a super pro leisure i think i brought this issue up even before i was on council i have come a long way to the idea that this um in the spirit of inclusivity the goal of having a Place that is for all residents and all people who want to use this is that it is an inclusive space that is for everybody. And I also have dogs. I my dogs have to be unleashed, so I cannot bring them to a place. That's my choice, but it's also a thing. I will not bring them to a place where, with dogs off leash. And so, you know, for me, I think a lot of this is about really um, finding an opportunity to have, as Rich said, good utilization of the property with really wonderful, I mean, we heard from a lot of people, especially the morning crew, who are really a community, who bring their dogs, they're very well behaved, there aren't a lot of incidents early in the morning, it's a group of regulars, they're really watching the property, and I think that has been really wonderful, and I don't think we wanna take that away. Um, but there are challenges with people, um, especially in those sort of after work hours, 
there it's just chaos. And so that's when sort of all hell breaks loose. So, you know, to me, I had proposed in, in one um, in email that I had sent to the committee and I'm not dying on the sword, but just something to think about, which was sort of splitting the baby as splitting the days in half for a couple of reasons. One, um, in order to make enforcement easier, having multiple enforcement times, three and five, and what it seems complicated and having kind of a single enforcement time seven days a week makes more sense from an ease standpoint. Um, I think it is, uh, it gives more of the same number of hours. Everybody's going to complain that they want the after work hours. Everybody wants the after work hours. Um, but there are, it does seem like, you know, there are more casual users who in village residents who might, you know, want to just walk over after dinner or walk over after, um, you know, after the kids come home from school and play for a minute or, you know, just that that afternoon time is not available right now. People also coming from all over Cincinnati right now are causing, I mean, as we get back into rush hour traffic, more traffic on Ridge Road. We don't have a turn lane and we don't have a, the infrastructure to have a turn lane right now for that. Um, the dog owners have brought up the issue that three to five is sucks because it's hot in the really, really hot. It's like too hot on the weekends during that time. So for the dogs. So, um, you know, the, the theory of that was sort of if you did and then you don't have to worry about dusk and times of year also if nancy's visions come to fruition which are you know you took words out of my head you know a picnic evening a movie night a food truck evening all these things you know those are going to be events where maybe natalie's buffer zone does the trick and i fully support all of that that you said natalie i like that idea very much um but i you know maybe that does the trick but you um but you kind of um you don't have to have if you have an evening event, you're also not having to do special things. So something like, you know, oh, uh, dawn to 12 or whatever, 11, 1, whatever that is, and then afternoon. Now, it does cut out afternoon hours during the week, but it, it gives you much more time on the weekend. So that was a proposal I'd had at some point. I'm not really dying on that sword, but just another thing to kind of consider um, as we think about some of the issues that go into it. So again, I, I want to reiterate just Thank you, Peg, and and just everybody had amazing ideas today, and I, I like there's so many threads to pull. We have a lot of a lot of exciting things to, to do with all of this. Um, I just <laughs> want to clarify. I never said anything about a buffer zone. <laughs> I, well, I mean, that. I mean your leashed areas. I meant yeah, your yeah. Can we, can, lead it, can we, can we move on to the next person, Councilman Warren? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Alita, and, and frankly. Um, I know the email that you passed around uh, almost two months ago or whatever, six weeks ago. Um, frankly, I thought that was very well uh, put together. And personally, um, I'm more inclined to, uh, to favor something like that that is morning hours. It's defined. It's every day. Um, and, and, and it'll likely restrict the property to Amberley residents as opposed to people from all over the tri-state. Um, another point I'd like to make, I mean, Several of council members have talked about this is not a dog park. I want to state, legally, it may not be officially a dog park, but it is a dog park. For all intents and purposes, today it is a dog park. It's a 130 acre dog park. That's how it's used and that's how it's perceived by the public. So for all intents and purposes, it's a dog park. And so the issue is if you want to move it away from a dog park, then you have to start defining what that is going to be. Um, I do agree with uh, Mr. Driscoll. Um, I think um, the, the ordinance that we currently have or the provisions that we currently have for the green must be enforced, okay? And so until something is resolved in terms of the future, what we do with this, definition of a dog park, whatever, the current provisions for that property must be enforced, okay? And maybe we'll learn in the next, whatever, four to eight weeks, wow, maybe things have improved. And maybe we'll learn that they have not improved, but certainly they must be enforced. Otherwise, it's not a law. It's simple as that. Um, a couple things, I know Mr. Bardak proposed this at uh, the committee meeting, and actually it, I thought it was an interesting proposal. Um, and that was uh, dedicating a, a portion of the green as a dog park. 
I think uh, he had said something about the back 20 acres or something like that, and, and it would be relatively easy to rope off or something like that. I would ask um, the village manager to determine what that cost might be. Um, because frankly, if we could designate a region, a contiguous region that's very well defined um, as a dog park, as an unleashed area, that could be all day. Okay. And it would also preserve 110 acres of the Amberley Green to be totally family friendly. Okay. And I think that's how the conversation needs to be framed. How do we make Amberley Green family friendly? Okay. It's not just dog friendly. You know, we had Miss Garber spoke earlier, and I kind of relate to some of the things she said. If I want to bring my grandchild to the green and there's an unleashed dog there, that dog may be as friendly as anything. But once that approaches my grandchild, who's whatever, anywhere from three to five years old, may jump on that grandchild. That grandchild will be imprinted with that experience probably for the rest of their life. Okay. That dog may be friendly, but it wasn't adequately controlled. Okay. So we're not talking about friendly dogs. We're talking about control. Okay. And again, I think the focus for this ordinance means should be, how does it become family friendly? So I've heard things about three to, uh, uh, three to sunset. I don't know. If, I'm not sure if that's what Peg had suggested. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I, I, then I misinterpreted what you, what you shared. Sorry about that. Um, I do have concerns about having the, uh, the most, the, the coolest part of the day is reserved for dogs. Again, does that make it family friendly? I think the answer is no. Okay. Um, the last point I wanted to make, and here I, I may disagree with Alita, sorry. Um, and that is, you mentioned a number of things that can, ancillary aid, ancillary items can be put off to be addressed later. I don't agree with that because it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of the puzzle, okay? If we're gonna solve this puzzle, then we have to address all these, all these points, whether it's, you know, uh, residents along the perimeter or what have you, or gardens or, or, or what have you. Um, and just one last point, and I know, and, and, and this individual I think has been somewhat disparaged in the past. At our last committee meeting, um, Dr. Willis spoke and Dr. Willis is one of those uh, residents that live adjacent to the property. And, uh, and, and taking a walk on the property, what I noticed, you know, not all parts of the green are mowed, okay? And so there are many parts of the green where the grass is quite high. Well, dogs, at least when I walked on the green, dogs are generally not running freely in those areas. They're basically by their owner. Now they may be unleashed even as I pass by, um, but where they, I will call frolic, will be in the grass, in the mowed areas. And I can assert that Dr. Willis does have a bird's eye view of what's going on on the green from his balcony. Um, and that's something he asserted and it's cer certainly something I can vouch for uh, having walked by that area. So I'll just leave it there. Again, the emphasis I think on where we move should be how do we make Amberley Green family friendly? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilman Hunt. I uh, want to echo, I, I, I think a lot of us have uh, made some great points, um, and, and I'm not, I don't mean to belittle uh, anyone and, and, and just the amount of time that we've taken uh, this evening discussing this, so I'll kind of uh, jump right in. Um, I think that the Amberley Green provides us an opportunity, again, and I've, we've heard this time and time again, that all of our residents, it's an inclusive place, and so to me, that's why I, I just keep finding myself uh, in a place where I, I feel like we have to do something. Um, I've read a lot of feedback on Nextdoor, on Facebook, uh, emails uh, that have been submitted to us. There's clearly a lot of people who have lots of feelings, um, either pro or against the compromise. To me, I, I think that the compromise is the natural first step. And, and um, Alita, you mentioned that the ancillary things and Ray, you so eloquently said that that's all part of the big puzzle. I think that that's all part of the same conversation. I agree. I think that we have to have those conversations as well. And, and uh, uh, Councilman Bardock, your, your point about approaching uh, Cincinnati Parks about a, a dog park at French Park, I think that's a great idea. I think that uh, whether it's at French Park, whether it could be 
uh, at, at uh, the green is great. Um, my understanding is, and I, I just want to make sure that everyone uh, is clear. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Chief Wallace, uh, part of the issue had been that you needed more clarity for enforcement and that this ordinance should provide that for you to be able to give you uh, more ability to enforce uh, the, 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 uh, the code. Um, and, and I think that's ultimately our goal is we want to make sure that we have a code that is clear. We have to have signage that is clear. We have to have a compromise that is a, a compromise. Everyone's going to have to give a little bit, but I think that ultimately this proposal uh, tries to do that. It tries uh, very hard to do that. So uh, that's what I wanted to just point out. All right, thank you. And um, I just want to make a couple comments and then I'll turn it over to uh, Councilwoman Conway. Uh, First of all- his hand up. Um, He had his hand up too, he can go before me. What? The chief had raised his hand, he can go before me. Or I don't necessarily okay. need to- First, Councilman Bardak, it is inaccurate to say that the village donated French Park to the city. That park was donated by Mr. French um, to the city. Uh, and, and it's subject to, it was part of his will uh, and it's very detailed and it, it very inaccurate to say that the village donated it to the, to the city. That, <clears throat> I just, I have read every single comment that has been sent in. I have attended every meeting over these two years, and I have specifically made a commitment to myself to start walking more down at Amberley Green, and I specifically walk without a dog down at Amberley Green. I walk my dog at French Park. And I have to say that it is very disappointing that it has come to this point. Uh, I am the number of people that say that it's they're not clear as to what the requirements are, et cetera, et cetera. As a dog dog owner, I am offended by those comments. It is common sense and common courtesy of certain things to do. And I I'll just list a, a few. If someone is walking towards someone and they don't have a dog, then you put your dog on a leash. That is just common courtesy. And I have to say, in my time over the last two years trying to walk down at Amberley Green, 90% of the people don't do it. And that to me is just not acceptable. If someone has their dog on a leash, it is common courtesy to put your dog on a leash. And it's just not acceptable to do anything different. If you are not familiar with someone walking towards you, put your dog on a leash. This is all common courtesy. And that's a, that to me is what is missing from all this. We People keep saying they need more signs and all this stuff. Well, just be, just be courteous. And then I would say your dog is not under control if you're on your phone. And I have seen just flagrant examples down at, there was, there was a time after a snowfall where I saw three kids sled riding on a hillside and I was pretty far away and these kids were having a good time. A dog, as it will do when kids are having fun, ran up to them and just started barking at the kids. The kids were petrified. The dog owner was 200 yards away on the phone. It took him a couple minutes. I started running over. Finally, the dog owner got off the phone, called his dog. That dog's not under control. Your, your dog is not under control if you're not nearby. It's very simple things. And then my last comments relates to, uh, and Mr. Driscoll kind of clarified it a little bit, but at the last committee meeting, I couldn't remember whether he used the term power user or super users, alluding, basically kind of alluding to the fact that because they're, I, I took it that they, they should get more privileges. My belief is it's the exact opposite. With that, they get more responsibility. 
And that more responsibility is that they set an example. And those people should be more so than anyone's to be putting their dog on a leash when they see one. They should talk to people about good behavior. That's what that's what people do. And and there was an email from someone that uh, just sent in the last day or two that offered that up. And I think that's great. I'd also say clean the grounds if you're if you're that lucky to use the thing much, that much. You know, I, you know, I I do go through French Park a lot, and my wife and I carry a garbage bag. We we carry clippers. Um, today we had a shovel to clean the bridges. That is what you do if you're lucky enough to use something more often. Um, it's just not acceptable the behavior that I see, and I don't care if it's a resident or a non-resident. It's just not acceptable. That's all. That's all I have to say. And I'll turn it over to the chief. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to be straightforward right now. I'm not going to make very very many friends tonight on this topic. And let me just start off with this. You know, if you want to blame and be scapegoat this enforcement crap, I'm sick of it. I've told you over and over, I'm not going to have an officer set up there and write tickets for stickers and dogs. You know, we reduce from 15 to 20 burglaries a year down to two every year. And I want my policemen on the side streets. You know, I've asked my, I've asked my opinion just a couple times of what I felt. Early in the morning, late at night is the best times for us to let the dogs run loose because three to five in the afternoon when we're getting caught up there, I don't want the policemen off the road. That's when there are more traffic. Them. That's when we have more accidents. You guys have less protection. You know, to sit there and say that it's an enforcement issue and the police aren't basically, you know, you steer away from saying that, but that's exactly what everyone's saying, Mr. Driscoll, Mr. Warren. And given the influence that, Ray, you don't have to shake your head, given the thing that we're not doing our job. Enforcement is, an, is, is important. But have I told you over and over, if people do not step up and sign the charges, there's not a dang thing we can do. We were up there last week. Somebody claimed their dog ran at somebody and jumped at them. Will you sign the complaint? No, we won't. We don't want to upset somebody. We can't sign it. No different than going to a house for domestic violence. We come after the fact. We try to put it together and do the best we can. We can try to address it. If you get a picture, a license plate, we can reach out and call them. But 99% of the time, that doesn't happen. It's rare to get anybody to cooperate with us when we do this. Listen, we, I take a lot of pride in this police department, and we have our officers, and I've been using auxiliary officers, and when they come in during the day and patrol, they hit the park, they check the parks, and that's what we want. But also, I have, I have seven synagogues in this community, seven Jewish facilities that I take a lot of pride in that we don't have anything go wrong. And it also puts additional officers on the streets. You know, you know we're, we were able to go with one less full-time officer, but with that, we're able to go with auxiliaries to increase our exposure, pay less money out. You know, I, I just can't see, you know, us picking times during the day. I just don't agree with it just to just let dogs run, run free. Because I'm telling you, somebody's going to be up there and it's always going to be somebody that doesn't know it because they don't live in the village, nor do they care to read online to follow out what our rules are. I told the man the other day, when we post these rules, I want to post them 12 more times throughout the entire facility. We have people that still park on Burning Tree. I had a resident complain the other day that people walk through their yards to go to the go to the green because they don't want to drive down here and get a sticker. The, the purpose of the sticker, we came up with that to be able to identify who's there in case something happens. There has been bad things happen up there to people, and it, it's any park that you go to. There's been people exposing themselves. We know stuff like that happens. So we want to identify the vehicles and people go there. I've never got a direction on the on the AV stickers. We went to the AG stickers to notify or to identify these people. Now, there's a lot of residents that do not want the AV sticker on their car. And they've said, I don't want it on there because if I'm in an accident, somebody thinks I'm from Amberley, so they think I have money and they're going to sue us. So if council wants to push it forward and want the enforcement, and you want me to cite all the residents that are up there because there's a lot of them up there with those stickers. We remind them when we see them, 
them and non-residents. Please come to the station and register your vehicle. We do it over and over again, but there's only so much we can do. And I'm telling you, if I still lived in this community, which I don't, if I still lived here, I, this is important. It, it's important to some people and I agree it's important. And I think that we have to address it, but I'm not going to jeopardize what I live for in this village. I live for the safety of every individual. When I go home, I'm still thinking about what's going on. I'm thinking about how many guys I have responding on fire runs or police runs or who's on the road. You know, those are priorities to me. You know, I think the dog issue is, a, is an important issue. But I, I'm, I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to leave an officer sit up there on a regular basis writing tickets. When that happens, we're never going to be there when it happens. If we drive through that park, somebody grabs their dog, puts it on a leash, you know, if you go up there and you walk on your own, we can see it. We've had an officer, an officer a few years back that he was bit when he was up there. So keep this in mind when we think about this. And, and Ray, I know that your wasn't a personal attack toward us, and you, you don't even need to respond. I know it wasn't a personal attack. I apologize for my words. I'm just trying to say, think about the enforcement side. And, you know, th this committee has been done a great job, Peg been outstanding on this. And Scott, I mean, we've researched so many other communities, so many different things, because we want to make sure we get it right. We, we don't want to fail at this. I mean, and, you know, I, I kind of look at Amberly as no different than us having an event or ice cream social stuff. You know, we've always been open and inviting to outside people, whether we allow people to come in and use the park with the grand stuff we have to. So it's just part of, it's something we're going to deal with. We're not going to be able to drive people away. And I, I, I'm good with more people coming in town. And hopefully they realize how great this community is and how great the people here, the council, the support of the council, and want to move here. I mean, that's how I look at it. We want to make it stronger and better. So, you know, if you ever have a question or problem, please reach out to me. If you have questions on the time frames when the complaints occur and things like that, reach out to me. Call me. I mean, 90% of the community has my cell number, call it. I'll get you the information you need. Don't just assume that we're not doing something. And and I was pretty straightforward with the manager until we get a direction on how we're gonna handle on the citation issue. It's kind of hard to write citations up there based on how it is. It says it'll be marked, it says it'll be a sticker. So a resident that pays taxes living in this building, you're gonna tell them they have to have a sticker to, to drive into a park that they pay to support. If that's what you feel like, we'll enforce it that way. But there are a group that will not put stickers on the car and we'll be citing them. And the backlash won't come to me. It'll be coming to you guys because unfortunately there's nothing I can do. That, that's it. Okay, Councilwoman Conway. Um, in the interest of not prolonging, we're not gonna vote till next month. I will defer my further comments until next month. Peg, there, there is one item that, I mean, I assume next month, you know, we'll have motions to possibly consider amendments. And there's one item that I specifically uh, mentioned to the village manager. It is uh, section H on liability. And we had kind of addressed this when over a year ago. I mean, state law very much covers liability and the way it's written right now it would lead you to believe that if your dog bites someone and you had your dog on a leash or you were in compliance you're not liable well that's not true under state law you're liable and so i would like to make a motion right now to remove section h because uh, it's not needed so i hereby move to remove section h which talks about liability is your amendment in alignment with what Scott sent us? No, it's not. Because because what Scott, well, maybe Scott can explain. Yeah, so in what we were basing this on was the issue came up. We had some earlier language in the, in the proposed ordinance. Uh, we went back and forth with Andy. And but where we rested was that Andy had come up, had drafted this language in regards to the to the liability, so that, that could be uh, could be addressed in the ordinance. But uh, the consensus was the same that 
the re liability rests with the dog owner. So regardless of this language, and Andy, you can weigh in on this, but regardless of this language, the responsibility, as the mayor said, rests with the dog owner. So I what I'm reporting in the in the memo was how sort of how that sort of came to be and what the current language is. But if it's taken out, the liability still rests with the dog owner. And, and legally, that's absolutely correct. Um, the reason that, at, and this is after discussions with Scott and Peg and, and somewhat secondhand on my part, obviously, um, it was a belt, that was an, a belt and suspenders kind of approach, Mayor. Um, but I agree with you. Um, it, it could convey that absent that provision, you're not liable. And that's, you're 100% right. Ohio law is strict liability. If your dog hurts or bites someone, you're on the hook for it. Um, regardless of what Amberly's code says. Um, like in the motion. I'd like to second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we we amend section H to remove the liability section. Do you have any discussion? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, I really don't like to to leave it completely blank and ambiguous with regard to liability my preference would have been to leave the language and tag on um the line in accordance with orc dot dot whatever whatever the ohio law is that way you are stating that ohio law it had um is strict liability for dog bites and, but um you know you're not just putting an ordinance out there with no mention of liability at all, like, okay, why why bother with the ordinance? Okay, you mean, you, I mean, my reaction was the fact that it says any owner or caretaker who fails to comply is liable. It doesn't matter if you fail to comply. So what I would propose is let's just we let's well, table you said this. Moved in let's, seconded, so I don't know, like, <laughs> no, let's let's table this till the next discussion. Uh, and, and see if we can come up with something better in the liability section. Tom, Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, like it does, if you want to like circulate language or something that's that can we is yeah. that like just process wise? Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what you expect the process to be at the next meeting in terms of some at of the, these questions? At and, the next meeting, well, we, I mean, we have a we have an ordinance on the table. We will we will have the third reading. We will probably have some some move some motions to amend that. We will we will vote on those amendments. Um, if if at some point we so if if council believes that they have so um, significantly changed the ordinance that we want to have another reading, we can have another reading. But we will we will go through the motions to determine whether there we want to amend it um, and any amendment that is approved will amend the the ordinance and then assuming that we have not amended the ordinance so significantly that we would need another reading we would then um, we could have a motion to a to i mean we don't necessarily have that i mean Three readings isn't necessarily magical. You can do four readings, five readings, whatever. But at the end of taking the uh, amendments, we could have a motion to approve, and that could be voted on. One more question. I'm so sorry. Do you recommend um, that we, if we have recommendations for you know motions that we would want to make, that we circulate those like to Scott or Andrew, Andy or something in advance, or not necessarily? We can just we just voice talk about it on the floor, and we'll be in person and. I think, I mean, if, if it's a very specific amendment that you want to get the language appropriate, then I would suggest you deal deal with Scott, and Scott can deal with Andy. Um, you can also, if you're not a committee member, um, talk to Councilwoman Conway, because she's obviously got a lot of background on it. If you're a committee member, you really shouldn't do that, because that would be uh, two, two members of the committee um, talking about something. Um, but, you know, I, I, I feel confident that based on the discussions tonight, 
that we'll be able to, I mean, I'm certain that there's going to be some proposed amendments, but I feel confident that we can work through this. I think Elisa later brings up great points. If people have, they think they want to make an amendment, it really would be useful to like think it through and talk to Scott and get it because I, I, I would like this to get done. Like we've really, it's been over two years. And so it would just be good to bring it to closure. Okay. Okay, that was, I think that was good. It, it took a long time, but uh, I think it's good that we, all the council members had a chance to uh, express their view. And uh, again, Councilwoman Conway, Thank you for your leadership on this, as other members of council have, have said. We'll now move on to the finance committee. Did Ray, did you have a question? Nope. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Um, the finance committee met a couple weeks ago, and this is the time of year where we always uh, review the tax budget. So this evening we are, um, there will be a resolution to discuss, to approve the tax budget, but the, the tax budget is this annual process where we submit the tax budget to the uh, county auditor. The primary purpose of the tax budget at this point is to demonstrate our need for our real estate revenues, um, both on the, the police levy and the general levy. So it is, it is something that it is not a detailed budget process that council goes through. That is done in October, November, and generally approved by council in December. The finance committee did uh, work through the uh, tax budget. Generally, the way they the tax budget is put together is pretty much off our budget of the prior of in this case 2021 budget with some slight amendments so before you this evening is our tax budget and i would first like to open the public hearing for the tax budget and i'm opening the tax budget at opening the public hearing at 752 and are there any residents that would like to speak about the tax budget? It does not appear that there's anyone that, and that's not unusual. I think, I think in my, um, this is my sixth uh, tax budget, or no, more than ten, probably uh, 11th tax budget I've been through, and I don't think we've had anyone speak on it yet. Uh, but I would hear. I like to close the public hearing at 7:52. Um, we did. It was close to seven. Uh, there are 7:53, so we we spent a minute on it. Um, and now I would like to make it. I'd like to move that we uh, approve the tax budget to be submitted to the county. County. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2021-21, approving the tax budget for the year 2022. Are there any comments? Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2021-21. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be it noted that the resolution passes unanimously unanimously and that can completes my uh, report from the finance committee we'll now move on to the public outreach committee Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is just an update to the full council uh, about the uh, public outreach committee uh, that met uh, meeting that met on uh, may 20th um, we had the opportunity to uh, get a tour of the new village website that is being developed by uh, our clerk of council here tammy reasoner um, it is uh, a magnificent looking website. Uh, it is uh, meant to promote the ease of access for all residents uh, while also broadening the marketing appeal uh, for the village. Um, it is very interactive. Um, 
It has uh, elements that allow it to uh, work very well for people of different uh, uh, needs, uh, both uh, with audio uh, sections, visual sections. Um, it is uh, very well uh, put together um, and it will make uh, the uh, job of updating the website also significantly easier for the village staff. So um, I just want to commend uh, Tammy and your staff for uh, all your work on getting that put together. And um, I think that uh, we are looking forward to seeing the new website when it does go uh, live here in just a few weeks. That's all I have to report from the Public Outreach Committee. Okay, thank you. Questions? Are there any questions for Councilman Hunt? I have a question. Yes. Uh, can we have a new group photo taken? <laughs> we need one because now we have Ben, but um, just uh, checked out the old one on the website. Mm. I think we can make that happen. Not in love with it. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, we'll now move on to the Streets, Public Utilities, and Sewers Committee. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> on June 7th, the Streets Public Utilities and Sewer Committee met. And uh, before you is Resolution 2021-22, which I will talk about first. And that is uh, in regard to easements for the Duke Energy Electric Service Line Burial Project. Um, as part of the Duke Energy Project to replace overhead electric lines with underground lines, the village needs to grant easements on village-owned property this time particularly on parcels 526-0050-0059 and parcel 526-0050-0026, which are located in the Twigwood area um, of the village. Um, the, uh, the first parcel is, up from, is on Twigwood Lane South to Fair Oaks Drive, and the second one is on Twigwood Lane North to the Amberley Green property. The overall work will replace the old power line poles. And at our committee meeting, we also learned that the phone and cable lines will also be buried. So, um, so I have a motion I, um, to authorize the village manager to sign the utility easements for Duke Energy Electric Service Line, for the Duke Ener Energy Electric Service Line burial project. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2021-22, authorizing the village manager to sign utility easements. Are there any questions or comments? If not, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2021-22. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? being noted that the resolution passes unanimously. Uh, the second item I'd like to talk about is the 2021 stormwater program. Um, our committee met right after the uh, formal stormwater advisory committee meeting, which meets annually. Um, Mr. Brown reviewed the upcoming, Mr. West Brown reviewed the upcoming programs. And as, uh, just to share um, background, the stormwater program pays for stormwater infrastructure such as catch, basin, catch basins, swales, manholes, and stormwater pipes, and 50% of total curb replacement costs associated with the street repair program. Fees from property owners are collected and billed through the Cincinnati Waterworks. The fees collected are related to acreage. At the beginning of 2021, the balance was about $201,000. We project about $213,000 in fees will be collected during the year. Expenses during the year include fees such as televising pipe inspections prior to pipe replacement work, Hamilton County stormwater fees, charges from our maintenance department for stormwater related tasks, and actual stormwater projects that are contracted out. The ending balance is projected to be about $273,000. The 2021 stormwater program includes installing a 110 foot stormwater pipeliner from 6915 Section Road to the Cincinnati Line, a stormwater pipeliner at 7001 Knoll Road, and reinstalling a catch basin and underground basins at 3590 Sorrento Drive. The current damage at the last location was causing unsafe driving conditions in the winter. 
The contribution of stormwater funds to the 2021 street program includes part or all of the drainage improvements, catch basin repairs, and curb replacements that will be conducted along Winding Way, Esther Drive, and Fair Acres Drive. Now, we anticipate considerably more expenses beginning in 2021, excuse me, 2022, as the village embarks on its eight year street repair program that we discussed uh, several months ago. So that concludes the streets committee report. Are there any quest questions for Councilman Warren? Okay, we'll now move on to the compensation and benefits committee. Thanks, Mayor. Compensation Benefits Committee met on May 19th, and this is our annual health care renewal meeting, and I had come with very good news this year. So uh, just a quick reminder, we're part of the, um, the pool, the, the local government pool, um, and as a result of that, we, we bid for you know, competitive rates each year on our health care and dental, and we review them in this committee each year and recommend approval. Um, Couple of reminders. Also, uh, there are two plans that um, employees can choose from. We pay 85% of the premiums um, for the at the lower level, um, and we our our plan year goes from um, August 1st to July 31st. So we're actually in open enrollment right now. Um, and the way we budget for this is we kind of have a stub year for the rest of 2021, and then um, into we'll be able to to um, we're able to kind of absorb the, those budgets into the next year. However, this year uh, we actually are going to have have really good news. So first of all, we're in the second year of our dental plan, so we don't have to worry about anything with respect to our dental. Um, but we are for our medical um, benefits are. Um, increase this year is 0%. So um, what we are recommending today is um, resolution 2021-23 um, to recommend the approval of the, uh, the employee medical plan at a 0% rate increase. So moved. Second. Oh, yeah, okay. Tom, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, uh, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2021-23, which provides for the medical insurance renewal at a 0% increase, uh, which is outstanding. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah, I've got Councilman one, Warren. I've got one comment. Um, Alita, you mentioned, um, and this, I see this in the narrative, and, and maybe this is directed to Scott, um, in terms of the, um, the, de the decrease expenses, he indicated that it may have been due to employees putting off procedures because of COVID concerns or the inability to have procedures due to COVID restrictions. And so my question is, do you anticipate um, not just increased usage, but are you anticipating um, the need to cover for folks who may have, you know, who, who may have put off these procedures and and now we may be kind of short staffed or something like that in the next year. Well, that's got an answer that, but we did ask that question in committee just so you know about like well, how to budget for next year. So we did ask that and um, Scott and Kathy took notes on on what the recommendations were on that, but I'll let, I'll let our village manager answer that. What, what happened here, Councilmember Warren, is we really have had less plan utilization overall. Now, I think most of us would concur that that's probably due to COVID. So one of the discussions we had early in the spring uh, was to do a COVID increase, do a percent increase that would uh, sort of give us a little bit of a buffer uh, in case some of that medical expense does come back to us in a, in a way that causes our healthcare costs to rise significantly. Uh, we we weren't real wild about that. Uh, we let a couple of months go just to see how that played out. And it turns out that those medical expenses did not climb. Uh, our reserves are in a good spot. Uh, just being good stewards of the of the of the public money, we could not agree that we should charge any more than a zero percent increase this year. Um, certainly it is it is fathomable that this next year, as we get back into more normal type operations that our medical expenses will increase. 
but not to the extent that we would want any, want to put any kind of a surcharge or set anything aside at this point. So all the, the professionals, the financial professionals, uh, and all the city managers were involved with this discussion concurred with that uh, with that practice. Yeah, I wasn't. Thank you for that reply. Um, I wasn't necessarily suggesting um, looking at it from an expense side mm -hmm. as opposed to personnel time. So in other words, if someone has a procedure and they have to be off work for whatever, three weeks, okay, obviously then we have to cover for them. And so if we had enough of those, if enough of those procedures were put off, for example, last year and are now going to be taken this year, what impact does it have on our right. ability to cover? Right, I'm sorry. I, 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 it's okay. I didn't That's frame that properly then. Yeah. So from, from that perspective, um, I would say just looking at our history here at Amberley Village, we've had employees that have had certain procedures done, medical procedures, uh, but probably not to the extent that would normally be done. Uh, I would not see that as being an issue. It's just something we would have to manage in terms of our daily operations. So if we're going to have uh, four or five police officers that are going to be out at a particular time, we would try to schedule that cover it with overtime. So that is the expense that would, would kick in. But uh, yeah, there, that, that could what could occur as well. Yes. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? If not, it has been moved and second that we adopt resolution 2021-23 for the medical insurance re renewal. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? be noted that the resolution passes unanimously. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the manager's report. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, resolution 20-21-24 is a bit of an anomaly. Uh, normally I'd be reporting to you that we uh, pursued the energy aggregate, the electric aggregation, and I'd re be reporting back to you who we entered into a, and a contract with. You may recall that in April, you uh, approved a, a, a resolution recommended by the Streets, Public Utilities and Sewers Committee to proceed with seeking um, quotes, bids for electric aggregation. Um, and this is a little different for in, instead of buying, like when we buy salt or police cruisers and things like that, the um, time frame for acting on a purchase, on a bid on electric is about 24 hours. That's the only time that you have to be able to respond back. So normally you would be informed of the, you know, who we went with, but in this situation, uh, once I received the contracts, I realized that the third condition that was in the resolution that you approved in April actually was contrary to what I was signing. So what you're being asked to do tonight is a housekeeping item to uh, amend the resolution. So resolution 2021-24 amends the resolution so that we can enter into the contract uh, with, uh, with Dynagy. And that stipulation was in regards to a, um, a, a section of the, of, a, of the resolution that indicated that it had to be less than our current rate. In this situation, it's just it's ever so slightly higher than our current rate, but it is still a great rate to lock into for the next 24 months. So it's necessary for a motion to, uh, to approve this particular resolution this evening. So do I have, have a motion? I move that we uh, modify the resolution as recommended by the village manager. <laughs> but we adopt resolution 2021-24, amending resolution 2021-12 regarding entry into agreement for the purchase of electricity. And as chair of the streets committee, I second that motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2021-24, amending resolution 2021-12 as, as explained. Are there any questions or comments? Mayor, I have one comment, yep. just because it's driving me crazy. Uh, the word purchase in the title is misspelled. Oh. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> the high school teacher in me. Yes. Wow. Good catch. That's all. <laughs> we'll take care of that. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, we won't have a formal, formal amendment for that, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Councilman Hunt. <clears throat> okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2021-24. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be noted that the resolution passed unanimous. Uh, so other items back to the village see. manager. Yes, so other items in the manager's report. Uh, our municipal building is open now, so we have reopened it uh, entirely. And uh, we're looking forward to our um, uh, council meeting next month when it'll be in person. So, um, and then our committee meetings will be in person shortly, shortly after, after that. Um, last year, the um, council established- Scott, the, Scott just, just one question on that. Committee meetings will be in person starting the 1st of July or later than that? Uh, most likely it's gonna be after the July council meeting because there won't, I don't know if they're gonna, there won't be any committee meetings prior to our July council meeting. Okay. So, uh, last year council created the uh, tree and bench donation program. And I just wanted to report that out. Uh, you, you're familiar with the tree that was uh, dedicated in memory of council member Hattenback. But we've also had two residents who have donated trees and those trees have been uh, paid for and, and planted uh, by, by the residents. Uh, Jerry Pabst uh, on Lynn Haven Drive do donated uh, uh, a tree for his, his loved one. That one is up on the upper hill uh, on the upper, upper track. And then Betty Whitaker on Long Meadow Lane, she donated a tree in memory of her um, late husband. And that tree is located on the upper section of the track and it's visible as you uh, pull into the parking lot on the, uh, on the on the north side. So we're very appreciative of residents. They're taking advantage of this particular program. Uh, we do occasionally have calls from residents wanting to know how to, uh, how to uh, effectuate that. So uh, we'll just continue trying to uh, um, put more trees, uh, reforest the, uh, the, the area around the, uh, around the municipal building. And Tom, I believe you're going to talk about the residential recycling program. Residential recycling program. Yeah, about the uh, award we re or the re the uh, rate that we received this year. I no, I don't have that. You can you can okay. do that. All right. So uh, each year, the uh, Hamilton County Environmental um, uh, um, the residential recycling uh, calculations are made. Uh, this year, Amberley Village diverted 1,300 tons of, of trash. And so we have received a diversion rate of 59%. So that is um, a pretty high rate. And so it's a result of a couple of things. Obviously our residents have a lot to do with, with that. Uh, the maintenance crew with the um, uh, doing the uh, various uh, chipping of brush as well as uh, vacuuming leaves that contributes uh, heavily to it as well. Uh, so as a combination of those efforts with our residents and, and staff, the uh, recycling, um, resident recycling has hit a high point. Uh, we're be, we are being issued a check in the amount of $13,500. So that is uh, the highest category of return for uh, recycling. So we're quite, quite proud of that. Um, the last item I want to mention is in regards to the car that is sitting on our hillside in front of the banner. That may have caught some of you off guard, but we're trying to take advantage of uh, uh, promoting distracted driving. So that certainly is a very uh, topical issue for us. And uh, Chief Wallace believed that a car on the hillside uh, where somebody had been texting and ran into something uh, that was very um, in your face and very, uh, very eye catching for uh, helping us promote um, um, driving, um, uh, driving and not being distracted. So that's the purpose of that. Just continue to take advantage of that, uh, that hillside. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions for the manager? All right. Um, Chief, over no to report. you. No report. Hmm? No report. Okay. Um, on the mayor's report, I have a few nominations that I want to uh, deal with. These are our, for our uh, our various commissions and boards, et cetera. And first on the Human Rights Commission, um, 
I think I had mentioned that I had been deficient in bringing to council the nomination for Monica Lira. When we, when we put the uh, Human Rights Commission in place, the Human Rights Commission provides for three-year terms for all members, but we specifically wanted to get staggered terms for that. So we had some one-year terms, some two-year terms, and some three-year terms. So in the case of Monica Lira, um, I hereby move to nominate Monica for a new three-year term, which would run from the 1st of January this year through the end of 2023. Uh, Monica was has been on since the beginning. She was part of a two-year term. Uh, and so Monica has said she would be willing to continue to serve. And I think it makes sense to continue to have Monica. This is, as you will recall, the way the Human Rights Commission, there are three council appointments, one appointment by the mayor and one by the village manager. The, Monica is a council appointment. So I hereby move to appoint Monica to the three-year term. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we appoint Monica Lira to a new three-year term, which will run from the 1st of January, 2021 to the end of December, 2023. Are there any questions or comments? Me. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, not about Monica in particular, but the Human Rights Commission, just really everything they're doing is exceeding, I think, all expectations. They really have um, embraced their role and they are coming up with ideas and developing those ideas into plans for the village, um, things that I, I myself never envisioned and I think they, you know, they are an example of how citizens can be part of a committee that is not uh, and not a member of council, and they can um, they can open our eyes or change the behaviors and practice uh, practices in the village. And I I didn't give a health education and welfare committee report today because um, something is in the works to be brought before council um, and. Maybe I'll like talk about it at the next meeting, but um, they really are just, I, I want to make sure that they know how much that they're appreciated. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, it's been moved and seconded that we appoint Monica Lira to, to a new three-year term. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Being noted that that resolution passed unanimously. And just so everyone's aware, Matthew Krause was uh, Scott's appointee to the Human Rights Commission. And again, his was a two-year term. Uh, Scott has appointed him to a new three-year term also. So his term would also run from the 1st of January, 2021 to the uh, end of 2023. And that, that is uh, the, the village manager's appointment. I would next like to nominate Scott Larmer, Peg Conway, and myself to the Joint Economic Development Zone Board. Uh, again, I was a little deficient in this. Uh, that term runs, that term will run from June 1st, 2020 um, to, to June 1st, 2022. And again, the, the members of that board um, serve with three members from Sycamore Township to oversee the Joint Eco Economic uh, Development Zone Board. So that's my resolute or my motion. Second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we nominate Scott Larmer, Peg Conway, and Tom Uthing to the Joint Economic Development Zone Board. Any questions or comments? Go ahead. Tom, did, did, did all of you speak well of the village while you were not official representatives? Yes, yes, we did. We, we seconded a motion or two and we sat there for literally these meetings last five minutes. 
I mean, if that. Some, well, once it was a little bit longer. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, next on the Stormwater Advisory Board, and this one actually, thanks to the village manager, I am very, I'm relatively timely on this one. Um, and I would like to nominate Nemetjo J. Rosami and Adam Greenberg to the Stormwater Advisory Board for a four-year term, which will run from June 1st, 2021 to May 31st, 2025. Now, in the case of Adam Greenberg, under our stormwater advisory board, we're required to have one member um, from our businesses in the village. And Adam has served that role um, for, the, for the past and is doing a great job. And the Met has definitely been involved in the stormwater advisory board almost from the beginning. And she, is, she has said she's willing to continue to serve and is doing a great job. So. I hereby move to um, appoint or nominate, or I move to appoint Nemet and Adam to the Stormwater Advisory Board. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we nominate Nemet Jarozami and Adam Greenberg to the Stormwater Advisory Board for a four year term. Are there any questions or comments? If not, it's been moved and seconded that we we nominate Nemet Jarozami and Adam Greenberg to the Stormwater Advisory Board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be noted that the uh, resolution passed you know, unanimously. And um, next, I would like to nominate Scott Rubenstein to the Planning Commission slash ZBA for a term which would be from the 1st of January, 2021 to the end of uh, December, 2024. The Planning Commission and a ZBA, those are four-year terms for all of them. Scott is the um, junior member or the shortest serving member of the Planning Commission. I think it makes sense to continue with Scott. Uh, Scott definitely is interested in continuing uh, in that role. So that's my motion. I'll second, and I have a question. Okay. Are these, are BCA appointments mayoral appointments or council appointments? No, this, BCA and Planning Commission are council appointments. Okay. It would be helpful if we could have a little notice on these reappointments because I have absolutely nothing against Scott Rubenstein, but I mean, it wasn't in the packet. It's not on the agenda. It just, you know, it's an opportunity in, to appoint different people, or maybe we should consider it a little bit more. No, that's that fair. is nothing about Scott Rubenstein in any way. I will, I will tell you, um, I mean, again, I have to remind the the next vacancy beyond this um, would be Susan Rissover and Rick Lauer, which will be the end of 2022. And they're at least both, that's, they've been on 12 years at least, each of them, right. haven't they? Right. Yeah, it's just a thought. Anyway, okay. but I second the motion. Any other questions or comments? If not, it has been moved and seconded that we nominate Scott Rubenstein to the Planning Commission. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be noted the resolution passed unanimously. And my last nomination, and this is to replace uh, Councilman Hunt on the uh, Tax Board of Review. Councilman Hunt served on the Tax Board of Review. I'm not sure for how many years but the board never met uh, and has not met in many years. Uh, but it does serve a very important role if, if we ever do have, you know, a need for, um, you know, a, a, a tax issue to be taken before the board because of disagreement that this is where it would first need to go. So I hereby nominate Steve Cromick 
to the tax review board. Uh, the village manager had identified Steve as someone who is a long-term resident and has been willing to uh, serve on this role. The other members of the tax review board are treasurer, um, Rick Kay, and who's the other one, Scott? Oh, it's Judy Barron. Yeah, Judy Barron, yes. Tom, I missed the name. Can you say it again? The, the, the new member would be Steve Cromick, spelled C-H-R-O-M-I-C. And, then, you know, this is something I very much rely on, Scott, because, you know, this is, if you ever had to come up with that, they would have to work with the, the staff to, to come in with that, so. Uh, so that's my nomination. I'll second it. Second. <laughs> okay, it has been moved and seconded that we appoint Steve Cromick to the tax board of review, replacing Councilman Hunt. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, just two other items I wanted to mention. I'd first like to thank uh, Councilwoman Conway and resident Amy Bogard for leading a discussion at our Environmental Stewardship Committee, our last Environmental Stewardship Committee concerning lawn care practices and the environment. You know, we, we had the uh, last Environmental Stewardship Committee. Um, we actually held the meeting up in the shelter house uh, at French Park uh, so that we could do it in person. Uh, and, and it was a great discussion. And Councilwoman Conway and, and Amy Bogart really did a great job leading this discussion. And the Environmental Stewardship Committee, including some relatively new members and new residents, were very uh, engaged. And this is something that's going to be we're going to meet at our next meeting in July to go through our um, action plan for the next two years. And this is something we're really going to focus on to, it, as something that is a way of, of basically communicating to our residents of alternative ways of maintaining um, your yards and things like that. So I really do think uh, Councilwoman Conway for bringing it forward to us. And then, as I said, the next meeting of the ESC is July 26. And then my last, last item, which is again, a thank you. I wanna very much thank uh, Timmy Reisner and Rob Ebel for helping us get through this difficult period of Zoom council meetings and so forth. It obviously has not been easy on us, but even more so, it has not been easy on them. They have worked tirelessly to try to deliver council meetings in the most efficient way possible. And Rob Ebel and ESP Media have just really done an outstanding job. And I can't thank them enough for what they've done. I hope, as I said to Rob, I hope this is a skill that he'll never need to use again, uh, but uh, it, he he really did a great job, and um, thank you very much. And that concludes my mayor's report. Are there any questions or comments? So we'll move on to new business. Any new business? And just one question I have for Scott. I don't know where I saw it, Scott. I, I saw something on the, maybe the schedule that the ice cream social is scheduled as a drive through ice cream social. Is that correct? Yes, we have a committee of employees that have been putting together the ice cream social and it's their belief that the 
uh, we will have a great successful drive through ice cream uh, social. So uh, they're doing a lot of planning for it. And uh, there's more information that's uh, they're going to be coming out soon about it. Okay. So it's still, it will be a drive through. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. And as the village manager said, our next meeting will be in person. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone uh, in person. And thank you very much. And, and uh, it's been a long meeting, but thanks a lot. Thank you.